Yeah, go ahead and have a seat. Take a deep breath. That was an amazing set. Amen. So, yeah, just take a deep breath. Um, I just wanted to come and give a little bit of an update. Lifeway told me today on Instagram that today is National Children's Ministry Day. So I thought that was a perfect day to kind of tell you about the children's ministry going on in this church. Um, So this past week, we had Backyard Kids Club. So if you notice, some people wearing these orange, or there's one orange shirt. Miss Finley's wearing an orange shirt, which is what the kids got, and all of our volunteers got a yellow shirt. That was on purpose. Um, We just wanted to share with you uh, how great this past week has been at Backyard Kids Club. We averaged about 50 kids per day, um, and at least half of those, maybe a a little more, were unchurched kids that probably wouldn't have come to a VBS or a Camp Spark that we did here at the church. And so it was just a wonderful opportunity to go out to the community and to reach the unchurched kids that maybe had never heard about Jesus before, or maybe they'd heard of him, but only once or twice, or just really didn't understand. And so we were able to uh, share the gospel with them. Some of them, we even got to send home Bibles. Um, And then on Friday, we had a big block party where we got to gather at the aquatic center uh, fields and just fellowship and play games and just really pour into those kids and invite them to church for the rest of the year. Um, And so with that, we do have a need for a van driver or a bus driver for Sundays. Uh, We had several kids, uh, well, their parents came to me and said, hey, my kids had so much fun this week, and they were really excited to come on Wednesdays and on Sundays, but I can't get them there. And so if you would just prayerfully consider um, if maybe God is calling you to serve in that way, to get some kids here that need Jesus and that are willing to be here, but they just need a little help getting here and getting back home. And so we also had sports crusaders this past week, and I think they had about 25 kids each day, and we had a salvation from that as well. And so that was very encouraging um, to see that. Um, And a lot of, well, not a lot, but a handful of kids were at sports crusaders and kids club, and so they were just doubling up on their gospel last week. And so it was very cool to see the Holy Spirit moving in their hearts and in their minds and um, to see that they understand that we serve an amazing God and that that God loves them so much and they have dedicated um, their lives to be in a relationship with him and to be Christians in that way. And so uh, just praise the Lord for that. We also today want to um, pray for the Salazars who are doing Hispanic um, mission or ministries here in Barry County. And so we just want to pray uh, for that family and that ministry. So would you bow your heads with me and pray? Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this church and for these people um, and for this town, Lord. I pray that you just equip us, continue to equip us uh, to serve those people here and to meet those needs. God, I thank you uh, for your Holy Spirit that comes and that just fills us uh, with a passion, with a love for you, and with a drive to do your good work. Um, I pray for the Salazars, that you would continue to provide for them in their ministry, continue to equip them to reach uh, the Hispanic population of Barry County. Um, I thank you for volunteers um, that have stepped forward and continue to step forward to serve in children's ministry. Um, and I just thank you for the, all that you're doing here and in this world. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, today in week nine of this series, Summer Playlist, we come to uh, Led Zeppelin's uh, hit, uh, Stairway to Heaven. Interesting, uh, the song was written in 71. It really didn't begin to pick up steam until about 1973. Uh, it became one of the band's all-time uh, biggest hits. Uh, in 2000, uh, there at the turn of the millennium, it was voted as number three on Rock's uh, uh, all-time top 100. And uh, the writer, the member of Led Zeppelin that wrote it, said he wrote the entire song in five minutes. It was as if something was pushing his pen. And uh, uh, interesting, uh, probably not an untrue story. I think there was something that was pushing his pen. Uh, the lyrics uh, say that uh, there's a lady who's sure that uh, all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. When she gets there, she knows if the stores are all closed, with a word, she can get what she came for. She's buying a stairway to heaven. You can look at the lyrics from several different perspectives. One is that she's just materialistic, and she's looking for heaven on earth, surrounding herself with, with things and possessions and stuff to to fill that, that hole in the heart that, uh, uh, that uh, makes us feel better about life. The other is that she's, she is approaching the afterlife with some sort of works-driven um, uh, mindset. Uh, folks, I'm convinced there's only two religions in the world. There's only two. There's Christianity on the one hand that says that man is hopeless and broken and incapable of reaching God on our own, and had it not been for God reaching down to us and building a bridge to us through the cross of Jesus Christ, that we would all go to hell when we die, that he reached out to us in our utter helplessness. All of the other religions in the world revolve around some sort of a system by which man attempts to be good enough, whether that's praying or doing good works or, or uh, taking care of the poor or uh, whatever it is, we are doing something to try to uh, uh, placate God so that when we stand before him, he won't still be angry with us, and he will let us into heaven. And, uh, and, and those are basically, you know, the, the uh, uh, other than Christianity models all revolve around some sort of a complicated system of do's and don'ts, and that if you do those to, uh, uh, at the right level, then God is obligated to let you in. But you don't know until you stand before him in judgment, and then you find out if you were good enough or not. Now, the sad thing is there's a lot of people in Christianity that believe in works-driven salvation, that there is something that, that, that we have to do, that we can do, that we need to do, and if we do it well enough, God's going to let us in, or, or that we have this cosmic scale that everybody thinks God has right outside the pearly gates, and if we put all the good stuff we've ever done on this side and all the bad stuff we've ever done on that side, if we can just get a, a, you know, just a slight tip to the good side, then he's obligated to let us in, and it's, it's the same thing. It's a human-driven model. I've become convinced over the years that salvation is a lot like golf. I don't know if you're a golfer or not. I know, I know Jimmy is over there. He, he, he loves the golf course. In, in, in golf, there is an infinite number, an un, unlimited number of ways to hit the ball wrong, correct? I mean, you know, there are common ways. But My father-in-law and I used to play on the Hannibal LaGrange, back when it was Hannibal LaGrange College up in Hannibal. It's now Hannibal LaGrange University. The front, the front uh, part of their acreage, they had an old nine-hole golf course sand greens, and the fairways were like a normal golf course's rough. And, and so you, you picked the color of the ball you were going to play with that day by what was blooming in the fairways. So if the, if the dandelions had, uh, were already you know, headed out in their white heads, you didn't dare use a white ball because you couldn't find it in that sea of little white blobs. Uh, I don't know how you can lose one of those purple balls, those fuchsia-colored ones in a, in a field of green grass, but I lost a bunch of them in there somewhere. And, and so my, we'd just go out after work, and we would play the front four or the back five 
if we had a Saturday, we might play nine holes, you know. And, and we, it wasn't really golf, it was whacking and walking, you know. And, and so we'd just swat at it with the stick and wherever it landed. Every once in a while you'd get a good drive or a good chip shot or a good putt, that kind of a deal. It was, it was pretty sorry for golf, but, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd line up and I'd address the ball and I'd swing my golf club and it'd go someplace totally other than where I wanted it to go. And I'd go, well, that's not where I was aiming it. And my father-in-law would whisper over my shoulder, yes, it was. <laughs> it went exactly where you aimed it. You might not have meant to hit it there, but that, you know, in the way that I stood, uh, the, wh- how far, you know, my feet were, where the ball was in relation, whether I kept my arm stiff or not, you know, and all of those kind of jerking my head up to look and see where it's going to go before I even hit it. And all those, there's a, there are just a, an infinite number of ways to get it wrong, but when it comes to doing it right, there's really only one way. And when you get to where you can consistently do that with your drives and consistently do that with your, with your chip shots and consistently do that with your putts, then they call you a professional. <laughs> because that's the difference between most of us and the professionals is they can do, we can do it right every once in a while. They do it right consistently. Salvation is the same way, folks. There's only one way to get this right. But the world, if you have ever shared your faith much, especially in our culture today in America, you will hear people say, not uncommonly, oh, I believe that there are many ways to God. There are, or that all, all paths lead back to God. And, and most of those revolve around being sincere. If you're just sincere, if just whatever it is you believe in, if you're just sincere about it, then God will honor that sincerity and let you back into heaven. And so today I want to address this, uh, this uh, uh, stairway to heaven that is built on the foundation of insisting that all paths lead to heaven, that all paths lead back to God. We're going to look at four basic points today. The first is that 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 concept, that all paths lead to God, undermines biblical authority. Either the Bible is true or it's not, folks. There's no in-between with this. And uh, if, if it's not reliable, then we can't build our life on it. Uh, number two is that this worldview, insisting many paths to heaven, uh, emphasizes human works in salvation, that there is contingent on what I do or what I don't do. Number three, it denies the holiness of God. And number four, it makes the sacrifice of Jesus Christ unnecessary. Now, I, I want to stop and say this logically, this worldview is absurd. It's absurd to believe that, 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 uh, that any way you go, you can get to where you want to go, that there's any number of paths to get there. I can, I, can get, I can go down, start driving south, and I can work my way down to Interstate 10. And I can hang, hang a right on Interstate 10, and I can start heading toward the west coast. And I can drive my car all the way to the Pacific Ocean, but I-10 will never get me to Chicago. You know, I can drive I-35 from top to bottom and never get to Orlando, Florida. Folks, we can't even take Highway 37 to get to Rogers. It stops on the other side of the Arkansas line and becomes something else. It, that's only 40 miles. It's absurd to think that a single path, that any given path, will get you where you want to go. For example, if you had a rocket, a spaceship today, that was capable of traveling fast enough. It, it, it's about 240,000 miles from the Earth to the moon. From the Earth to 240,000 miles. So let's assume that you have a spaceship that will fly 240,000 miles an hour. So you could make the trip from Cape Canaveral to the moon in one hour. Pretty quick trip. So you wait for a good night and a full moon, and you line that rocket up, and you take off 240,000 miles an hour, you leave the surface of the earth, and an hour later you get to where you had pointed that thing toward the moon. You know how far you missed the moon by? 10,000 miles. 10,000 miles you would miss the moon if, it, if you could get there in one hour. Folks, it, it's not about just lining it up and shooting for it. Everything in space is moving. The earth is moving, the moon is moving, our solar system is moving, and this idea that I can just go to the moon any way I want to, 
just steer toward the moon, it's not going to work. It takes the complicated computer uh, system in that, in, that, uh, in that spaceship, that rocket, and a very good computer engineer to come up with the formula that will get you from where you take off, when you take off there, ultimately to the moon. In the Apollo program, they took off, they circled the earth, they slingshotted off the earth, and they headed out toward the moon where they would, they would catch up with it, and then they would orbit it before they would land on it. And, and it's a complicated. There's not a lot of ways to get there. There's one, there is one formula that would get them from where they started to where they wanted to go. And, and the same is true with salvation, folks. And we'll look at this. First of all, the idea that, that there are many paths to heaven undermines biblical authority. We, uh, and, and lest you think you have to write all these down real fast, uh, we printed them out and they're in the foyer. So they're in order and by topic. So if you want to grab these, you can get those on your way out. Don't feel like you've got to copy them down off the slides real fast. But uh, John 3.16, that, that we all commonly know. People that have never darkened the door of the, the church oftentimes know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But we stop there. And we shouldn't. Because it goes on to say that God sent his son into the world not to judge the world. But to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has been judged already for not believing in God's one and only son. God's one and only Son is the one and only way to get back to God. Now, we get into this part about judging the world. It, you see, Jesus' first time here, he was not about judgment. Look at the way he ministered to people. I mean, the fact that he just didn't turn the twelve into dust is an act of God. Those guys, I mean, every turn... They, they, were, they were doing boneheaded things, and he just loved them anyway. He just poured grace out on those guys. Uh, but the woman caught in adultery in John. And she's caught in the very act, and they bring her to him and say, what should we do? And he said, oh, you know, what does the law say? And they said, Moses says the stoner. He says, the stoner. But let the one without sin cast the first stone. And it says they all left from the oldest to the youngest, the biggest sinners to the younger sinners. The less experienced sinners. And then he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, nowhere, Lord. And he says, then go and stop sinning. He, he had every right to start throwing rocks, folks. But he said he has not come to judge the world. His first coming was about bringing grace and salvation to a humanity that was helpless and hopeless without it. Now, folks, he's coming back. And the second one is all about judgment. Read scripture. It'll talk about sheep and goats and on the right and on the left and all of those things. And we'll talk about more of that a little farther into the message. But, but he, he clearly indicates that it's him. In case you doubt this, go to John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way. He didn't say I'm a way. I'm one way. I'm an option for he said, I am the way, I am truth itself, and I am life itself. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is what God has testified. He's given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Folks, Scripture says over and over again that Jesus is the only way for mankind to be made right with God. And either it's right or it's wrong. And so those who say there are many paths are saying that scripture is unreliable. I believe the book. I'm a six-day creationist. I, I believe it's literally true. I believe it from the table of contents to the maps. Everything I look at in Genesis 1 and 2, I see witnessed in creation to this day. That whales make whales and elephants make elephants and parakeets make parakeets and people make people exactly what we see in Genesis chapter 1. Everything was created, fully mature, and reproducing after their own kinds. No new kinds. No new kinds. We can have ligers. You can crossbreed a lion with a tiger and get a liger, but you can't get two ligers together and make more ligers. We can, we can breed a horse and a donkey and get mules, but you can't get two mules together and make baby mules. 
We can't make new kinds. And there are no new kinds. We're losing kinds, but we're not making any new kinds. Everything is following the pattern we see in Genesis chapter 1. The book is trustworthy. There is more There is more bibliographic evidence for the accuracy of this book than any ten pieces of uh, literature from antiquity combined. Take Homer, take Plato, take Aristotle, take Euripides, take Flavius Josephus, take Shakespeare. And there is more, there is more manuscript evidence for the accuracy and the credibility of this book than any ten pieces of literature from antiquity combined. Nobody's questioning Homer's writing. Nobody's questioning Plato. Nobody's questioning Euripides. Some people questioning Shakespeare, but that's a whole other story. But, but it, 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 the book is true. The book is reliable. You can build your life on the book. But to say that there are many ways to God says that's not true. That's not true. The Bible clearly and consistently teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way God has ordained for humanity to get to heaven. Period. End of discussion. The Bible is trustworthy and true. Number two, that to believe that there are many paths to heaven emphasizes human works in our own salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9, it says, God saved you by his grace, unmerited favor, when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. It's not a reward for the good that we have done. It's not a reward for the bad that we didn't do. It's not, it has nothing to do with whether I merit it or not. It has everything to do with the grace of God. I, I, when I was growing up, I had a, a great aunt that lived in Florida. I think I met her once. And, and uh, on occasion, she would send a Christmas present or a birthday present. I'd been sick, and, and, and she sent a get well present. I, I, I probably couldn't pick her out of a lineup. We didn't correspond. We didn't chat on the phone. I knew she existed. She apparently knew I existed. But she would, from time to time, go out Think about what an 11-year-old kid in Oklahoma would want, would buy a present, would wrap it up, would box it up, and would ship it out to me. Folks, why did she do that? Because she wanted to. She loved this great nephew that she had barely ever met, and she sent me a gift out of her grace. It wasn't anything I'd ever done for her. It was just a grace gift. That's what salvation is. Salvation. Is a, is a grace gift from God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, which unlike grace is not getting what we deserve. He washed our sins away, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Folks, we don't deserve this We don't add anything to it. God did all of the work, and just like receiving that present from my great aunt, salvation is a gift that he conceived, he bought, he paid for with the life of his only son. He's wrapped it up, he's delivered it to you through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's offering it to you today out of his grace and mercy unmerited favor we we can't lose it because we aren't worthy of it because we weren't worthy of it when we got it it's not a thing that's based on worth it's based on God's grace his love and his mercy not giving us what we deserve we are saved by the grace of God his unmerited favor 
not of any good thing or things that we have done or could do someday, might do, might refrain from doing. It is an act of God's grace. Number three, there can't be many, uh, many paths to God because if there were, it would deny the holiness of God. Folks, God is holy. And although he tells us that he is love, he is also righteous. And he must judge sin. He doesn't have any choice but to act within the context of his character. Acts 17.31 says, For he has set a day for judging the world. You read the Old Testament prophets. There is coming a day. The day of the Lord will come. Over and over again they talk about this moment in time. He has set a day for judging the world with justice. Oh, folks, that's something you don't want. Just, you know, people say, God's not being fair. Read the book of Job. God's not being fair. You know, God's not being just here. Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, if God was really fair, bad things wouldn't happen to good people. And we accuse God of not being just. We don't want God to be just. We do not want that to happen. Because if God is just, he will give us what we deserve and I can't live with those consequences because what I deserve is death and hell. And if God gave this world what it deserved, we would just hear the cosmic flush valve go open and the whole planet would just swirl the drain and go straight to hell. He doesn't give us. But there's coming a day where he will judge the world, humanity, with justice by the man he has appointed and proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead he will he will do it by jesus christ revelation twenty two twelve 12 says look i am coming soon bringing my reward with me to repay all peoples according to what they have done according to what they have done there is a judgment coming there's a time where he will separate the sheep and the goats the, those on his right from those on his left those who will enter into eternal reward in heaven and those who will enter into eternal punishment in hell. God is holy, people. And even though he is the very definition of love, he's also all righteous and therefore must judge sin. There is no escape from his, just, his judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, uh, uh, well, for 19, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 19, beginning at verse 11, it said, I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it, and the earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and books were opened, including the book of life, and all the dead were judged according to what they had done, according to the books. And the sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. All will stand before the throne. And folks, my only prayer in this is that when he calls me up and I fall before his throne and he opens my file, what he will find is the blood of Jesus Christ covering a multitude of sin. That's the only hope for me. That as an, old, uh, an eight-year-old boy in First Baptist Church of Ponca City, Oklahoma, I walked down an aisle and gave everything I understood about me to everything I understood about God and that, that that faith act that he responded in grace toward and Jesus' blood paid my sin debt number four and this is the biggest point for me of all that, that if there were if there were many paths to heaven then Jesus didn't need to come and die. Matthew 24, 26, 39, Jesus is praying in the garden moments before his betrayal and his arrest, moments before they will hurt him through a series of illegal trials, moments before they will beat him so badly he will be unrecognizable, pull out his beard, flog him almost to death, strip him naked, parade him through the streets under the cross beam where it falls on him time and time again till he is unable to carry it and they impress another man to carry that up to uh, the foot of Skull Hill where they will nail him to it and he will labor six hours on that cross 
being nailed to it, who, he who knew no sin becoming sin for us in paying the sin debt that we accrued, that he didn't owe. He wasn't obligated to do one thing with, but he chose to because he loved us that much. Folks, let's imagine, those of you who are parents, let's imagine that uh, the Dr. Fauci from the CDC knocks on your door this week and says, hey, we've just made a, an important discovery and that your child has within their genetic structure the, the cure for cancer. Not one kind of cancer, but all cancer in all people, in all places, in all times. Every kind of cancer could instantly be cured. But the, the catch is that we're going to have to take your child's life and we're going to have to put them in a blender and swirl them up into people goo. And, and then we can give a little bit of that to anybody with cancer and it will, it will save their lives and cure them. What would you say to him? Are we sure this is the only way? Is there the remotest possibility that there's some other person on the planet that this would work with? Is that not exactly what Jesus asked in the garden? Father, have we considered all the options? Is there any other way? Folks, if there were a one in 10 trillion chance that humanity could be good enough that some person could live a sinless life and get to the end and, and be saved by doing nothing ever sinful, then Jesus didn't need to go to the cross because it is within the grasp of humanity to do it on their own. But because he goes to the cross, it is absolute, unarguable, unarguable, truth that he and he alone is the only possible way what father is there who would kill their child if there were another way around it Jesus the only way folks not many paths one if there were any other way for humanity to be saved from sin, no matter how small, no matter how remote, there would have been zero need for Jesus to go to the cross. You just pray hard enough. You do enough good stuff. You give enough money. You volunteer enough. You refrain from doing the wrong things. All of these things people are trying to do out there to, to make God not be mad with them, mad at them, and... And yet, if that was possible, Jesus didn't need to die. End of discussion. End of discussion. All will be judged. Jesus makes all the difference. No other way to heaven. So for those who believe that there are many paths to heaven, I have two questions. The first one would be, what proof do you have that the path that you are taking will lead you to your des desired destination? What is it you're basing your belief that if I just pray long enough, if I, if I walk down enough aisles and I fill out enough cards and I recite enough prayers with enough preachers and I get dunked in enough tanks and I show up enough at church and I volunteer for enough things and I give enough money that God's got to let me in, Right? That's not what the book says. The book says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? Preach in your name, cast out demons in your name, and work miracles in your name. And I'll say, depart from me. I don't know who you are. You who practice sin. You see, folks, it's not about something that we do. It's about what he did. And connecting with that. I, one of the phrases that, that just always kind of sets my teeth on edge is when people say, I accepted Christ. Folks, that's not a miracle. The miracle is that he accepted you, that he accepted me. What proof do you have? What are you basing it on? What, what, where is this found? Some nut job that wrote a book in the 1980s? 
that you found on the, on the, on the shelves at Barnes & Noble? What are, you, what are you basing it on? Where does it come from? And the second thing I would ask them is, are you 100% comfortable in staking your eternal destiny on that assumption? And if they look at me and say, yeah, then I'd say, well, you know, drive carefully, buy some hand sanitizer, and get a mask. Because you're rolling the dice every time you walk outside. Every time, well, the bed's not safe. 6,500 Americans die every year falling out of bed. So, uh, you know, I don't know what you do. Wrap yourself in bubble wrap and hope for the best. But folks, I know that if I drop dead in this moment, that as I fell on my face at the feet of God, I would plead the blood of Jesus that as an eight-year-old boy, I gave everything I understood about me to everything I understood about him. And I have no chance, no hope, save for the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Accepting the gift that he gave. The Bible says we are all sinners, folks. They say the foot of the, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Presbyterians, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, Satanists, we all have the same exact problem. We are all sinners from our mother's wombs. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. That's a little Greek word there, P-A-S, pos. You know what it means? All. Everybody. Every single one. We're all in the same boat. None of us are better off or farther up or farther down. We are all in the same boat. We are all sinners. We all deserve death and hell. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. What we have earned is eternal torture in hell. That's what, we, that's what God owes us. If he's going to be fair, that's what he'll give us. We are completely helpless to save ourselves. Uh, in Isaiah 64, verse 4, the prophet says, For since the world began... No one has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. We, don't, we can't do anything but wait on God's salvation. Wait for the Holy Spirit to draw us. Wait for the Holy Spirit to, to convince us that we are sinners, to convict us of our sin. In, uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 44, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me and... Uh, at the last day, I will raise them up. Folks, unless God draws you, we are helpless and hopeless and cut off. And that's all pretty bad news. But the good news is that Jesus Christ has done all the work. He's taken all of God's wrath for our sin so that through his perfect gift of salvation, man might be forgiven and saved from not only the consequence of our sin, but the power of sin over us. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Folks, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is who the Word of God says He is, and that He has done what He says He done, we will be saved. We will be. It doesn't say you might be, you could be. You will be. That's where salvation is found in Him and Him alone. It is impossible for people to build or buy their way into heaven. But God knew that before the earth was ever created. And he designed the plan, the one way, the only means by which humanity might be redeemed to restore his creation to himself. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 20. Do you not know that it was not with things like silver and gold that you were redeemed, but with Jesus, with the blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without spot or defect, who before the foundation of the earth was laid volunteered to pay your price and mine. Folks, according to John chapter 1, who made people? Jesus. Nothing was made except by him. And the one who made us knew what it would cost him to make us. And before he ever breathed life into the nose of Adam that he formed out of the dirt, he knew what the price tag for people would be. 
and he had already volunteered to pay it. It's all God and nothing of us. So the only question today is, what are you counting on to get you into heaven when you die? If you died right now and you found yourself standing before God the Father, what would you tell him to get him to let you into heaven? Well, I, when, I was, when I was 12 years old, I went down that aisle and I, the, I, I, the preacher recited this prayer and I said those words after he said them and, and then I filled out this form and the church all said amen and they dunked me in the baptistry a couple of weeks later and I'm good to go. No, you're not. Folks filling out a Broadman form and saying some words that somebody else said to you, not going to save anybody. We've given the Catholics a hard time for 150 years about confirming people after catechism. And we let them walk down an aisle and fill out a form and recite a prayer and call them good. Folks, it's about a change of heart. It's about embracing God's only gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with filling out a form, repeating a prayer, or walking down an aisle. What are you counting on today to get you into heaven when you die? Folks, if you don't know, you have no idea today what you would tell God, what better day than today to get it right? Because you can't build a stairway to heaven. You certainly can't buy one. Nothing we bring to this table. We are broken and helpless and hopeless save for the blood of Jesus and the gift that he brings. Have you claimed it? Is it yours? If not, what better day than today to get this ironed out?